Okay, we find ourselves in the Gospel of Luke today on chapter 9. Luke is one of those writers that uh, if you were to count up the volume of, <clears throat> of words that he wrote, look at the number of verses that he wrote, uh, this is the, the most amount of any one writer in the whole New Testament between this and the book of Acts. You count them both together, it's the largest chunk in all of the New Testament, even more than what the Apostle Paul wrote. This is a long book, and so is uh, uh, the book of Acts. But we come to chapter 9 today. I'll be reading verses 1 through 22. There are those points in, in any of the Gospels where there's sort of a, a continental divide, where it's kind of like the apex, where... Um, in the, in the Gospel of Mark, uh, Mark, for instance, it comes in chapter 8, where the statement that we're going to be reading here is found, or Peter's statement of who Christ is. Uh, in the Gospel of John, it would be uh, the continental divide there within that book would be the raising of Lazarus. But in this book, if this is not the continental divide, this is certainly one of the important uh, points as we uh, move through the the book of, uh, of Luke. So let me read verses 1 through 22, and it really builds up to that portion that will come toward the end of uh, Peter's confession. And everything that Luke has been writing has been really building to that point, because it's now uh, at the place where Luke is going to show us who exactly is Jesus Christ. Okay, let's begin. Verse 1, I'll uh, read, you follow along. Summoning the twelve, he gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. Then he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Take nothing for the road, he told them, no staff, no traveling bag, no bread, no money, and don't take an extra shirt. Whatever house you enter, stay there and leave from there. If they do not welcome you, you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and traveled from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing everywhere. Herod the Tetrarch heard about everything that was going on. He was perplexed because some said that John had been raised from the dead, some that Elijah had appeared and others that one of the ancient prophets had risen. I beheaded John, Herod said, but who is this I hear such things about? And he wanted to see him. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus all that they had done. He took them along and withdrew privately to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds found out they followed him, he welcomed them spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and healed those who needed healing. Late in the day, the twelve approached him and said, Send the crowd away, so that they can go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find food and lodging, because we are in a deserted place here. You give them something to eat, he told them. We have no more than five loaves and two fish, they said, unless we go and buy food for all these people. For about 5,000 men were there. And he told his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. They did what he said, and he had them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them. He kept giving them to the disciples to set before the crowd. Everyone ate and was filled. And they picked up 12 baskets of leftover pieces. While they were praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, others, Elijah, still others, that one of the ancient prophets has come back. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. But he strictly warned and instructed them to tell this to no one, saying, It is necessary that the Son of Man suffer many things 
and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed and be raised the third day. Now this is an important point, as I mentioned, and it is this word that needs to get out. If there's any important message that needs to get out today, in the day in which we live, it's this right here about the kingdom of God. This is probably the most important message, and it is the most important message that can be announced on planet Earth today. And that is that God is inviting people all over the world to join the kingdom of God. If they want, they can join the kingdom of God. And to announce this to people in the same way that the angels did it at the birth of Jesus, I bring you good tidings of great joy. And so we spread the tidings around that Jesus saves. And this is the message that he was intent on spreading in his own day, and he gave us the same mandate to do that which, which he did. Now, to as many who will listen, and not many won't listen, but to many, as many as will listen, this is the message that they need to hear, that God is present today and that he is building and enlarging a kingdom that is going to replace the kingdom that is present in this age. And it is a different kingdom. It's a new world that will replace the one that we see presently. And entrance into that kingdom, and everybody is invited if they want to come and be a part of it, but the entrance is only through Jesus Christ. There is no other way into this, this kingdom that he is offering. And this kingdom is comprised of his own people. That is, we call it the church. But it's called the household of faith in some places. It's the new community. It's the new people. It's his people, the people of God. And this new age, this new world, this new kingdom that he's building is going to replace the present one very soon. And this kingdom is described a little bit in the book of Revelation in chapter 20, 21 where it envisions this future age. Listen to these words. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity. You get that? That's very important. God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and will be their God. That's where this is all going to. That is the ultimate, because that was the original design. That's the way life was intended to be. And those who are part of that kingdom will experience that. Now, this is the word that needs to get out. And people everywhere are invited to join the kingdom of God because that is what you were created for. If you want it, you're invited to come. Now, getting the word out is a major theme within the book of Luke. We find that Jesus stayed on mission to make sure that this word got out. Everywhere he went, from village to village, town to town, he spoke the same thing, same message, and that was all about the kingdom of God. He kept saying it again and again and again. And this is what we find in chapter 4, verse 43. He stays on mission. There was a town that said, would you just hang around with us? And he said, no, no, these are his words. It is necessary for me to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because I was sent for this purpose. Now, for about a year or more, the disciples did nothing but simply follow Jesus around and listen to him and watch him. From what we can gather from the Gospels, they had no assignments. They did nothing but just follow him around for, for a year or more. And they heard him preach this day after day after day. And they watched him. They watched him deal with the physical needs of people. 
and he, they watched him rescue many from demonic possession. But for the most part, what they did was just follow him around and listen and watch. And there's no evidence that they did anything beyond that. And it was only Jesus who was doing the preaching. And they heard this again and again and again, the same message. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. That's a summary of what it would have been a fuller message, a fuller sermon. But they listened to him do this, and they listened to him day after day. And the disciples must have heard this preached so often that they had it memorized. They could say it by heart, exactly what he was saying in village after village. And so if they had had no assignment other than just simply to listen and to watch, observe what he was doing, when we come to chapter 9, now he enlists them to do what he had been doing and what they had been watching and listening. Now, chapter 9, verse 1, summoning the twelve, he gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases, and then he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So he enlists them and he commissions the twelve to fan out. And as we read in the Gospel of Mark, they did it two by two. So they had six groups that fanned out into all of the villages and in the towns, and he gave them authority and power that they did not have before, but he commissioned them. He gave them a mandate. And they went into all of these different towns and villages to proclaim this message. And they had power to heal diseases and to also rescue those who were oppressed by demons. Now, I would imagine that when Jesus taught that, um, unlike what you see in some of the movies from Hollywood, that he must have been very animated. I think that he was in a very interesting person to listen to and to watch. And he grabbed your attention and he kept it. And I would imagine that he was most excited when he would talk about this kingdom of God because he knew this was the greatest need that people had, was to learn about and to embrace and to to respond to the invitation to be a part of the kingdom of God. Because this This message that he he, uh, preached gave them hope. I mean, look at the world in which we live. It's full of bloodshed and misery and the vacant look upon people's faces. And you listen to their stories. and, and, And you think, what is the answer to this person's greatest need? And it's Jesus Christ. And he's offering them himself and the kingdom of God. And everywhere he went, he announced to them that God is doing something new. And I would imagine it triggered the emotions of people as they were stirred up and stimulated by what they heard and full of optimism. And to see that God really cared about them. Not just in what he said, but he demonstrated it. I mean, you know what it's like when you're feeling miserable and sick and diseased and, 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 and a disability. You long for that to be removed from you. Wouldn't it be great to have Jesus heal you? And wouldn't you want to listen to what he said? And he was doing that all over the place. God cared about them. They knew that. And he demonstrated that. And he preached it. And he called it being born again from death to life. And he knew that that's what people needed. And many people wanted to hear that. They loved listening to him talk. Now, do you get charged up about that kind of a a message and a vision? I mean, I do, especially when I look at the news today. And I look at um, at the mess that the world is in. And I recognize that this message, that God is doing something that is going to replace the mess that we're in, and a new kingdom, a new age to come, and this is the future and the hope for those who are in Christ, I recognize 
that my, myself, being a part of that kingdom, that that's the greatest message and it's the greatest need of the world today. It isn't politics and it isn't some kind of a, of a revolution. It's, it's Jesus Christ. It's the greatest need for, for, for of any place. It was C.S. Lewis who made the observation that if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Do you sense that people are looking to satisfy something that this world cannot satisfy? Then it's most probable that they were created for another world. And that world, Jesus Christ, is creating today. And he's doing it all over. It's not a geographical location. It doesn't have a world leader. There's no organization or denomination. It's about people that are part of his kingdom. And they come in, in, in all uh, ethnic groups and, and economic groups and strata and stations. They're all over the world. Now, when we come to this portion, we're looking at four scenes in chapter 9 that we'll consider today. And the first scene is in these first verses where it's very captivating in how Jesus briefs his disciples in what they should, to, should do when they go into these villages and they begin to preach. And so he briefed them. And we're going to kind of look at what he said because there's some things that we should have as takeaways uh, with this. And the first thing that I see here in what he told them and the power that he gave them to heal diseases and to proclaim the kingdom of God is that both of those are combined. There's a sense and, and a very real uh, important lesson to be learned here of of melding together not only the message, but also the compassion and the practical way of being able to meet people's needs. Because Jesus not only met the broken bodies, but also the needs of broken souls. And both of them are attached together. It's the whole person that God is, is, in, is concerned with. Not just the proclamation. And eventually we, we look and we see in, in the scripture where these broken bodies that we have will be resurrected to, to new bodies. And, uh, we, but we do suffer. But God is interested in you, the whole person. And so we watch Jesus at work and he would do this from in village after village that he would address the physical needs and the emotional needs. And I would imagine it wasn't like an assembly line where, you know, you've got uh, 90 seconds, you're going to work with a person and then the next one comes along and just get them all stacked up ready for their healing, you know. No. He, he would have talked to them. What's your name? And do you, are you from around here? And, and, and getting into their lives a little bit? And, and what is your need? How can I help you today? And he would talk to them and address their needs. And as we do that with our community and our friends, they're very likely to want to hear the message of the kingdom of God, that God is doing something in the world today. And so not only do we address the physical and the emotional needs, but also the needs of the soul. You know, that principle or that adage that says that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Luke 9, 6, look at verse 6 again. It says, so they went out and traveled from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing everywhere. So our compassion shows that that we are not only concerned with the whole person, but God is concerned with the whole person as well. And it makes sense that, that God would be like this, and it also allows the message to just come alive. The second principle that I see found here as he briefs his disciples before they're sent out is that he tells them to focus on people who show interest in this message. Because there are those who are going to reject it. 
And he says, you've got to let those guys be. You've got to move on. They're not interested. But I want you to give your attention to those who express that they want to hear more. That they are, are interested in, in, a, in, a, in our setting. It might be, I, I would be very interested in attending a Bible study with you. Th- that would be of interest to me, you know. Somebody says it. Or I would, uh, I, I would be interested in reading with you through the Gospel of Luke or the Gospel of John as you invite them. And you concentrate on those who respond. We don't strong arm people who aren't interested. We certainly are going to throw out some kind of a gimmick. I hate those things. You know, it's like a bait and switch thing. And we're not going to get involved with chasing down somebody who has no interest. You know, it says in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, how the Holy Spirit is like the wind. And it makes a statement that as the wind blows where it pleases, so the Holy Spirit moves. As he pleases. And how do you know where the wind is at work? You listen for it and you watch it. And in the same way, that's the way the Holy Spirit is. We listen to people and we watch. So that if someone that you invite to sit, you know, maybe it's your your campus and you'd really like to do something with some other students and you're going to throw out the opportunity for for people to read through, let's say, the Gospel of John with you. And you say, you know, at noontime on Thursdays, we're going to meet during the lunch hour, and uh, we'll, we'll bring our lunch, and then we'll talk, we'll talk, and we'll read through, just section by section through the Gospel of John. Would you be interested in doing that? Well, if the Holy Spirit is at work, and the wind is blowing, you're not only going to hear the wind, but you're going to see it. And it's become evident because they're going to respond and say, you know, I think I would like to do that. So, so don't assume that nobody's interested. In, in, in fact, I, I think that this is, this is an important principle that, we'll, that I'll, I'll hit in just, in just a moment. But, but the third thing I see here before I move to that is, um, is Jesus gave us a reality check and said, now expect some hardship. Because the natural heart does not respond favorably to the gospel message. Because the message in and of itself forces us to deal with our sin problem. And as I said last week, we are incurably impressed with ourselves. And therefore, we don't want to admit that we have a problem before God and it's our sin. And that we are guilty before Him. And that we feel our shame, whether we admit it or not, we feel it. And we understand that we need to humble ourselves. And he calls us to repent and to believe. And we need to admit that. And so that kind of message of relying not upon our own effort and works, but relying entirely upon Jesus Christ, for many people that goes down sideways. And they'll push against it and they'll resist it. In fact, the interesting thing is, and you see this in the book of Acts, is the greatest amount of resistance came from the religious people, those who were in charge of, you know, the the religious community. And time and time again, Saul the Pharisee tried to destroy the church. And he's just an example of uh, of how the hardship that Christians experience. So therefore, while... While Jesus said there are going to be people who are very promising and will respond to your invitation because we're ambassadors of Jesus Christ, inviting them to be a part of the kingdom of God. And so we're inviting them. Would you like to be a part of this? And you're going to find some that will respond because that's where the Holy Spirit is working. There will be, on the same way, some people will say, you know, I don't want anything like that. In fact, don't even talk to me about your Jesus. I don't want to hear it. Well, you move on. You don't keep pressing and chasing them down, saying, hey, grab by the scruff of the neck. Say, listen, no. 
He said, you know, what do you do? Well, in the disciples' case, they went to the edge of town. They shook off the dust. And they said, you know, you're going to have to deal with it before God and his judgment because you don't want anything to do with the, the message here. Well, that's scene number one. The sec second scene here of this Herod the Tetrarch, who was uh, one of the um, people in charge um, of, that, uh, of, the, of the government. And I asked the question, do you think people are curious about Jesus? I think that they are. And evidence of this in his day was Herod. Herod was very interested in who Jesus was. Very curious. Because he had heard reports. And so he even asked the question, who is this man? And some say, well, he's John the Baptist. You know, you beheaded him, but he came back from the grave. Well, that's kind of spooky. And the others said, no, no, he's Elijah. Or he's one of the prophets. And, and Herod, the Tetrarch, is very interested because he said, to, he said in effect, and, and you can see this in verse 9, he says, I, I want to see him. I, I, I've heard the opinions out there, and everybody's got their opinion of Jesus today, of who he is. But there are others who would say, you know, I really would like to know for myself who he is. And that's where we read with them through the Gospel of Luke. We say, You're, are you interested? Are you tired of listening to this person's opinion or that? And somebody says, well, you know, he was a great religious teacher or he was a, he was a great religious figure. Some would say, well, you know, he was the enlightened one or he was a shaman or something of that order. And say, I'm tired of the opinions. I'd really like to know for myself who he is. And that's where you say, I think I can help you. Or would you be interested? Herod was very interested. So never assume that nobody wants to come to the Bible study. Never assume that they would just turn you down of reading through the Gospel of, of John and handing it to them and saying, you know, if this is of interest, can we meet next week? And uh, we'll have coffee together. And we'll just take a little bit of time. And then you decide for yourself what you think about this. Well, we come to scene three, and the scene three helps us to answer that question that Herod was asking about who is this man, and that is, who is Jesus? And this question that was on his mind is on the mind of a lot of people, and the account of feeding the 5,000 really helps us to answer that question. What is it about the feeding of the 5,000 that opens a window to what is the kingdom that he kept preaching about? And, um, and this new age to come, because this account is sort of like a preview of things to come and also a preview of what God is doing right now. What was taking place there has got some deep lessons for us to learn. That's why all four Gospels, even John, was not one of the Synoptic Gospels, but he was one of the four, and all of them have the same account. Something is important about this scene that we're reading here, that have read. What's interesting also are the deeper lessons to be learned. Now let's look at the occasion. The occasion in and of itself is that the disciples had returned from their preaching tour and they were wanted to debrief with Jesus because they had learned a lot, experienced a lot, seen a lot, and he had some things that he probably needed to review with them, too, about things they could have done better or things they could have changed or given them kudos about, yeah, you did that right. Well, he wanted to get away to do that with them and have sort of a retreat. That was the intent. That didn't happen because word got out as to where he was headed and the whole crowd showed up. And we read in Mark's account that when he saw this large crowd... He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And then he began to teach them many things. I mean, he looks at the crowd and says, I, I can't do the retreat right now. <laughs> These people, look at them. They're wandering about. 
I'm looking at their faces and I'm looking at the, the vacant look in their eyes. I'm seeing that they, they've got no purpose. They, they see no significance. They're just doing their religion and that's all it is. It's just empty formalism. I've got to teach them. And so he began to teach them. And this went on throughout the day until it's the late afternoon and the shadows are beginning to stretch across the landscape. And the disciples approach him and say, you know, it's getting late in the day. I think they need to be dispersed and go into the countryside to find some food and lodging. Now, when you combine all four accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you get a full picture of what was going on here. And the full picture goes something like this. They approach him about sending them away. And in, in, in the Gospel of John, Jesus turns to Philip one of the disciples, and he poses the question to him, you know, and says, well, uh, where are we going to buy bread so that these people can eat? And, and then John, ad John adds and says, well, Jesus asked this to test Philip because you already knew what he was going to do. So he throws it out to Philip, knowing Philip is going to say, I don't know. But he sets them up because he's got something planned. And their reply was, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. And how many is them? Well, 5,000 plus women and children. So you do your own math and come up with that figure. There's a lot of people. Then Jesus instructs the disciples to have them seated in groups of 50 in an orderly way. They, in the meantime, have found a, a boy who brought his lunch. Probably his mother made it that morning. Five barley loaves and two fish. And the boy was willing to give up his lunch to give it to Andrew. Andrew brings it to Jesus and said, here, this is what we've got. This is all we've got. Can you imagine that little boy looking at that lunch <laughs> and seeing what happened to his lunch? I mean, and then went home to mom said, Mom, you wouldn't believe what happened to my lunch. <laughs> well, the, Jesus gave thanks to the Father. He broke these, this meager lunch into pieces, and he created, he created food. Not just a little bit of food, but a lot of food. More and more and more food, till verse 17, everyone ate and was filled. I think that's important. Not that, you know... I really could use seconds here. No, everybody was filled, you know? And, and then it says they picked up 12 baskets of leftover pieces. Now, on the surface, this is an extraordinary miracle. But this is far more than just filling empty stomachs. The first thing here is that it shows us the heart of God um, and the compassion of the, of the Lord for, for providing something that the world cannot satisfy, because that really is the lesson behind the actual miracle. The same quote that I, I gave of C.S. Lewis, that if you're looking for something to satisfy that cannot be found in the world, then you must be destined, or it must be provided in a different place. And Jesus is saying, yeah, I'm the one who will provide it. But God is interested in satisfying that need that you cannot find. And I know you're searching and searching for it. And you haven't found it. But God is interested in supplying that for you. And, and the second thing that I see here is that God has the power to meet the deepest need of our soul. This occasion in the Gospel of John is accompanied by Jesus' statement when he said, I am the bread of life. And so what Jesus is doing here is that he's doing that which only God could do. Didn't God supply manna in the desert for the children of Israel and did it for 40 years? And doesn't God here in the flesh, in the person of Jesus, supply not only physical food, but in the same way that he supplies physical food, he does that for the soul. He feeds the soul. And not just that you want seconds, but he fills it to the full 
and people are fully satisfied. And we invite people to embrace Jesus Christ and say, he will do for you the same thing that he did for the crowd. And if I were reading through the Gospel of Luke with a friend who, who didn't know anything about Jesus and is just really interested in just kicking the tires to see if this is something I like, I'd say, you know, what do you think is being taught here? Do you know that what is happening here in the physical is the same thing Jesus will do for you in your soul? And that's when the light bulb goes on. And I say, wow, you know, I'd really like that. People are searching. They want that. Now we go into this, this scene here, the next scene, the final scene, where Luke uh, moves from the feeding of the 5,000. And he does this deliberately. He ranges all of these accounts and these scenes very deliberately where we see the next portion where Jesus is with his disciples and he asks them the question, who do the crowds say that I am? And the same kind of answers that, uh, that we found earlier with that question from Herod, are the same things that they repeat here and say, well, some say you're John the Baptist, others say you're Elijah, or one of the prophets that's arisen. And he said, well, what about you guys? Who do you say that I am? I mean, what have you learned so far in after watching me and following me around for all these months? Who do you say that I am? And that's when Peter gets the answer right. And he says, well, you're God's Messiah. You're the one sent by him for the purpose of redeeming the world. Now, listen, he didn't get all his theology because he had things to learn. And Jesus adds to this in verse 22 where he said, it's necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and be raised on the third day. Now, they didn't understand that. I mean, this didn't compute because it wasn't within their paradigm of what a Messiah should look like. So it wasn't about suffering. They, they still didn't get it until after the resurrection. But what we do see is at least they got it right as to the identity of who Jesus was. Well, you're God's Messiah. And then he fills in the gaps by saying, well, look, I'm here for a mission, and that mission is going to take me to the cross, but I will be raised on the third day. Now, this, is, this was a, a mystery to the disciples until, uh, until, as I said, after the resurrection. Then it all came together. He gathers them together after the resurrection. He reviews all that had happened over the last uh, years and, um, and, and all kind of fits. You know how you know, you have one of those aha moments? That's when it all hit to them. And they said, oh, okay. Well, almost, because even when he was ready to ascend, they still were asking, are you going to bring in the kingdom? And he said, no, you still don't get it. I'm going to ascend. I'll be back, though. I'll be back. And that's when all is going to be culminated and brought to a conclusion. Well, what do we learn here today? Well, we learned, first of all, that God longs for human beings to have a close, personal relationship with Him. That's what we were designed for. And that's life at its best. It, to be living under the rule and the blessing of God. That's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is to be living under His rule in the place where He, he has designated and, and under his blessings. That's the kingdom of God. But to establish this new age, this new kingdom, this new community that he's, he wants to do and he is doing, Jesus Christ was sent as God's Messiah. And he came with completing the task that he was assigned to do, and that task was different than what many would expect. And it took him to the cross. And the cross was in order to deal with the sin problem that we had. There was justice that needed to be met, God's justice. And God's justice was poured out upon Jesus when he was beaten and crucified and he died for our sins on behalf of us, in our place, as our substitute. And that's the only way that we can come into a a, a close personal relationship with God. It had to happen that way. There was no other way. 
except through the cross. And the resurrection proved the success of his mission. And he announces to us hope. Hope that those who believe in him can enter into this kingdom, into this new family, this new, this new community, and to be a part of something that is going to take us to the conclusion where there's going to be a new world. And that world is described for us in the scriptures, lots of different places in the Old Testament, but also certainly in the book of Revelation. Now, do you think that this is a message that people need to hear? Why, sure they do. Absolutely. They need to know that God is inviting them, if they want it, to be a part of the kingdom. If you want it. Do you? Are you a member? Are you a resident in that kingdom? Have you done that? Or are you still searching? I urge you to take a hard look at Jesus Christ. Nothing should excite us more than to have this assurance that we are residents and members in this in this great community. And how do we enter into it? By faith in Jesus Christ. I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. And no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. Now maybe you have been looking and exploring as to who Jesus Christ is. Maybe somebody online is watching, and that's been of interest to you. Who is this man? Well, rather than accept the opinions of others, why don't you do your own research and look into the gospel? Look at what was written about him from people who saw him, were with him, listened to him. The gospel of Luke is very straightforward. It just kind of gives you, this is what happened. This is the history that we see here, the historian in, in, in Luke himself. And, and, and say, ask yourself, are these the words and are these the works of a man who's just trying to promote himself? Or, or, or is this a man who really cares about me and cares about my soul? And, and, uh, and is, is, this, is this about my future, my destiny. And um, I think that you'll become convinced that Jesus is exactly who he claimed to be and that he is God the Son commissioned by the Father to rescue human beings from eternal disaster. And he did that by dying for us on the cross. Now, if you, in your exploration of who Jesus really is, come to that conclusion, you're invited to be part of the kingdom. Have you done it? Would you like it? I can't find anybody who said, well, I'm sort of disappointed in this. Nobody has ever said that. Well, let's go before God in prayer and with thanksgiving, too. Our Father today as having explored this <clears throat> through the eyes of, <clears throat> of Luke, we pray today that you would not only reinforce in our own minds the privilege of being part of the kingdom of God, but that we would also extend that invitation to others who are searching. We live in a world today where the majority, the majority is just groping along like in a dark room, trying to find their way, and they have no clue where they're going. He truly is the blind leading the blind. But we pray today as we invite others that the Holy Spirit would work and would blow as the wind, and they would respond and say, yeah, I would really like to learn about who Jesus is. Help me to do that. God, to that end, we pray that you would open doors of opportunity that we might declare the gospel as clearly as we find in Scripture and to do it faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen.